Covenant Church. I am so glad that you are with us uh, via the Facebook, and I just appreciate that you are part of the community here at Trimont. Uh, again, this is a great place to grow in Christ. It is a great place to mature. It's a great place to listen and learn of how much our God loves us. And so a special welcome to all those who are visiting and a special welcome to all those who call this home. Uh, we are glad that you are here. Uh, announcement for tonight is that we are going to be uh, closing our Saturday evening services. Uh, no longer will we be meeting on Saturday. This is our last Saturday, but we will continue to put our uh, services on uh, Facebook so that those who are unable to attend are able to hear uh, the Word of God uh, as, it, as I understand it and as the Spirit leads, and so that you still can participate uh, in worship. That will be done on, on Sunday morning, and so our services will be done, uh, will not be on until after the Sunday service, uh, sometime Sunday afternoon, we hope. So thank you for participating. Thank you for uh, being faithful. Thank you for uh, the witness you are for Jesus, where you're at. Um, blessings to you. We're going to begin, uh, as we have been through this series in the book of Revelation, as we are listening to what Jesus has to say to the churches in Revelation, the, the words of encouragement, the words of sternness, and also the words of repentance uh, to come and return. We've been doing our call to worship from uh, chapters 4 and 5 of Revelation, in which we are entering the throne room of God. And so tonight, uh, we are again in Revelation chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. And I will read them aloud to you, and you may follow along if you have your Bibles. Um, but we are also going to be looking at chapter 2. So our call to worship is again, we are in the throne room of God, and God has asked, is there anybody worthy to open the scroll that he has written on? Who is worthy to undo the seals? And it is said prior to this, there was nobody in heaven, nobody on earth, nobody under the earth that was worthy of opening. But the angel said, do not fear to John. Do not be sad for the lamb has come. He is worthy. And so we see the throne room of God. We see the Lamb coming. So in verses uh, 5, 6, or 6, 7, and 8, we read, And between the throne, that's the throne of God, and the four living creatures, and among the elders, I saw a Lamb standing, as though it had been slain, with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who is seated on the throne. And when he had taken the throne, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. For the Lamb is worthy. Let us pray. Gracious God, I thank you for today. And I thank you for this amazing picture that you have given to us of the activity that is happening in heaven in your throne room. And that even there in heaven where all the spiritual beings are, where all is taking place in amazing sights, there is still only one who is worthy. The Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. And not only in heaven, but also here on earth, there is only one who is worthy, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. May he speak to us. May we listen to him. May we hear what he has to say to us. Thank you. Thank you for loving us so much. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we are looking at Pergamum. Now, I have a story to tell you. Several years ago, uh, when we were living up in northern Minnesota at Moose Lake, we had built our own home. And as 
one day I received a phone call while I was at home in the evening and it was kind of a private conversation. And so not wanting uh, either Jane or the kids to hear it, I took the phone and went to the utility room. And there I was listening to this conversation. This person was speaking to me. I was speaking back. And, and I was walking, kind of pacing in that area between the washer, dryer, to the freezer, to the door that was uh, out to the deck uh, and back. And as I was kind of doing this triad, just bouncing back and forth, I was, when I got to the door, I kind of leaned against the wall and the floor kind of moved. And I have to say, I, I kind of quit listening right there because like, why did the floor, mm, and, and I kind of, you know, bounced on it and, mm, mm, and all of a sudden I'm, I am not listening and I'm bouncing on the floor going, what is going on here? I mean, this should be solid. And, and I bounced here and there and the floor would bounce and then it stopped and I got closer to the dryer and it bounced. And then, and so anyway, the conversation ended and I went to the, the basement with a flashlight and check what was going on. Cause we had a full basement and we had trusses and I went there and I turned on the flashlight and I was looking up there and Boy, it looked like good wood. It, the trusses looked good. And, you know, I couldn't understand. So I went back upstairs and I bounced again and it kept bouncing. And I went downstairs and, well, the, the trusses are on the, on the outside wall. And I thought, well, we had insulation. I'll pull that insulation off and check. And, and I was pulled off some fiberboard and pulled that off, foam board. And then I pulled off the kind of the pillow of a fiberglass. And as I pulled that off, all of a sudden, wet, mushy wood came down. And I looked behind it, and it was all brown and yuck. And I took my finger, and I poked it, and it went right through the sheeting of the house and pushed right into the siding. Oh, no! And I pushed again, and it went right through. This was rotten. And... I'm going, how did this happen? And I pulled off some more pillows of insulation. And yes, there were several places, about three, four uh, feet of mush of wood. And it was, you could stick your finger through it. And then I went out upstairs again and going, how did it get so wet? And, and I start looking around and the door frame was amazing. It was, we had painted it. It was nice and sealed. And, and I started clicking and going, it was solid, and all of a sudden, thump, I stuck my fist, my fingers, right through the woodwork. What I found out was we had an extension jam on the house, on the door, and when it rained and the, the, the water would come off the roof, it would splash a little bit on the deck, and it would splash against the wall, and in the door frame, that was not sealed where the extension jam was put and it wicked into the extension dra jam into the studs down to the floor and around what end up happening we had dry rot about a three by six foot area on the floor it had rotted out the door frame it had rotted out some of the studs that our wall was on it had rotted out about half of our floor trusses our flooring we had to replace, it was a mess. Dry rot. Now, if you've ever seen it, whether wet or dry, it is a fungi that is in your wood caused by the moisture. And it's a fungi that destroys the fiber and the strength of the wood and it becomes nothing but mush. Everything looked amazing. The floor was good, the wall was good, the door was good, the insulation, everything looked good, but when you took it apart, it was corroded, it was mush, it had no strength, and the integrity of the building um, in that area was compromised. That would be a good illustration or word to describe Pergamum. It has dry rot. It's not, it's being attacked from the outside, but it is not the attack of spiritual warfare that is damaging it. It is the dry rot that is happening from the inside out because of stuff they have let in. 
The words, we're going to just take a little bit before we look at Pergamum and just use like one word descriptions of the churches we have looked at so far, just to help us. So for Ephesus, we would say the one word is legalistic. They have forgotten their first love. They want to do things right, and they did things right, but they had lost their love for people and for people, lost people to be found. Legalistic for Ephesians. For Smyrna, the word we would use is persecuted. And that was a word of encouragement to remain faithful through trials. So Ephesus is legalistic. Pergamum or Smyrna is persecuted. And for Pergamum, dry rot. There is decay because of assimilation of things on the outside to the inside. That water has seeped in. That water of, of destruction has seeped in and it is destroying the foundation of the church. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. And I'm going to read that for you and you can read it also alongside of me. So here's the word. To the angel of the church in Pergamum, write, These are the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you live where Satan's throne has his th where Satan has his throne yet you remain true to my name you did not renounce your faith in me even in the days of Antipas my faithful witness who was put to death in your city where Satan lives nevertheless i have a few things against you there are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food, sacrificed to idols, and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore. Otherwise, I will come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. All right, so some observations about this passage from Chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. So who is the person speaking to us? Just a quick observation. It's Jesus. He's the one speaking, all right? Now, how is Jesus described to us in this passage? You notice that each time it's, he's described a little different? Well, he's described as the one having the sharp two-edged sword. It is a like a Roman uh, sword for close combat, not a big one, uh, but a, a shorter for hand-to-hand -hand combat, a gladiator sword, so to speak. Now, what does Jesus know? Um, what does he say about it? He says, I know where you live. And in fact, you notice that in each of the churches, he, he knows about them. How does he know all this stuff? Well, we learn that right away from the first chapter. The one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. The one who walks among the churches. Jesus is present. He knows what's going on. He knows what's happening then, here, and yet to come. And so he knows what they're going through. Okay, he knows everything. So, the answer says, I know what's going on. I know what you're going through. So, we have to ask the question, what do we know about Pergamum. So is there anything that we need to know about Pergamum? Well, as we have said, Pergamum is in the area of Turkey, uh, present-day Turkey. It is not far from all the other towns. In fact, if you had a map, maybe you have it in your Bible, but maybe you could find another map of Old Testament or New Testament uh, map of some sort, you will find that Pergamum is a little bit inland and is in the um, in what we call present-day Turkey. And it's kind of like a major road that will attach Pergamum to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, Laosia. So they're all in a kind of in a line, and they are probably a church planted 
maybe from Ephesus or from one of the other churches. Okay, what else do we know? Pergamum, we know, is a very religious city. Okay, very religious. Now, it is a major city in the Roman Empire, and many of the cities in the empire had, they attached themselves to gods or became the, the city that that god would look after. Well, these are all Greek gods or Roman gods. And Pergamum, well, they were taking no chances. They wanted a lot of gods to be in their favor. So I'm just looking here. And so they are a very religious society. One of their uh, temples they worship is a temple of Zeus, the Greek god Zeus. He's the god of the sky of lightning. He is the, the leader of all the, the Greek gods, okay? They have a temple to Athena, which is the daughter of war. So kind of, um, he's a daughter of war. And she is the daughter of Zeus. Maybe just listen here. Daughter of Zeus. Um, they had a, go a temple to Demeter. And this is the goddess of grain. And so that for crops and productivity and fertility. And she happens to be Zeus's sister. Starting to hear a theme here. And then they had a temple to Dionysus. If I have that say, they're right, Dionysus. It is the god of the grape and wine. And he happens to be, guess what? Zeus's son. And, and so they had a temple for him. And they had a temple for, um, let's see, I can't think, I, I think I say this right, Ascalypsis. Um, it is the god of healing. And they wanted that. So guess what? He's not a relative of Zeus, but legend says that Zeus killed him. So there's a theme here, a lot of Zeus's around here. So they have a lot of temple worship that is a part of their culture that is gods watching over them and they want the favor of the gods on their for, on production of wine, production of the grain, of fertility in the land. They want protection from the sky. They want the skies to rain and they want healing to take place. So they have a lot of temple worship and activity. Plus, they're in the Roman Empire. And did you know that the Roman emperor is a god? And so there was Roman emperor worship in which there was a temple dedicated to whoever was the present day Caesar. And you offered sacrifice to him because he is a god. So Pergamum is a very religious place. All kinds of temple worship, all kinds of things are taking place. And Jesus says, I know, I know where you live. I know what's going on. And I know where Satan's throne is. Now, ask this. So in the midst of all these temples, it, does Satan have his own temple? Mm, own throne room? Mm, yes and no. There was not a dedicated temple for Satan. So at that point, it's not. But Satan is behind all that is going on. He knows that if he can keep people religious, meaning doing things uh, for God or to God, or but doing on behalf of God, as long as he keeps them busy being religious, they have not time to walk with Jesus. And so Satan's throne is just saying that he has control of this area. He has power, influence. He's the prince of this world, and he is mighty powerful there because he can manipulate people through worship of other gods because he, he just has that kind of control. So Satan's throne is there in that he has tremendous influence. And yet the gospel of Jesus Christ is flourishing there. Just want to hear the gospel is flourishing. You think with all this religiosity going on that there would be no room, but there is room because religiousness, what it's been stuff you do for God or stuff you have to do or don't do, always leaves you empty. I just want to tell you, when you are doing stuff for God, just because you have to, to make him like you or so you can get a blessing out of it, always leaves you dry. And Jesus offers not something you have to do, but he offers himself a relationship. 
And that was filling the people. That was, they were hungry for something because they had been fed nothing but sand. And so the gospel is, is taking root there. There is persecution that is happening. Now they say a, a brother, Antipas, was killed there. Right there where they live, right there where Satan's throne is. But the gospel is finding fruit. But Jesus does say, but I have three things against you. I have three issues. First issue, you have some who hold to the teaching of Balaam. If you want to, you can write this down. It is Numbers chapter uh, 22. And, and for Balaam, he's the guy, remember, that has the tonky, talking donkey. Just a quick story there. You know, uh, Balaam is uh, a religious prophet or so. And king of Moab goes to him and says, there is a group of people who are coming over from Israel a massive foreign group that are going to, they're immigrants, they're foreigners, and they're going to take over the land. I want you to curse them so they cannot succeed, that God will destroy them. And Balaam says for a certain, gives them a bunch of money and say, Balaam says, yeah, I'll do it. Well, in the way to go and curse them, as he's going there riding his donkey, God sends an angel with a sword. And this sword is to destroy Balaam. And when the donkey sees this angel standing in the roadway, the donkey veers off into the field. And another time he, he sees him and he goes walking against uh, the shrubbery and, and, and scratches Balaam all up and, and he's going down the road some more and there's an angel again and he goes against and he rubs against the rocks and, and because of Balaam cannot see, he just beats on this donkey and God gives a voice to the donkey and the donkey turns around and says, why are you beating me? I have always served you best, and now you're beating the tar out of me. And God opens Balaam's eyes, and he sees the angel with the flaming sword. The donkey saved his life. That is not what we're talking about here. It is actually in Numbers chapter 25 and 31, 25 and 31 in Numbers, where the king of Moab is still trying to find a way to destroy Israel. And they are being tricky and seducive. Balaam has taught them that if you get to their God, if you get them away from their God, you will win them over. And so what they did is they sent their women to go and visit Israel to invite them to come over to have a meal, to come and be a part of the festivities and the celebrations that are going on, which happened to be a celebration of Baal. And as they were a part of the celebration, they start eating the food that was offered to Baal. That's a part, offered food to idols. And they uh, started to be, since you're here, you can, you know, you don't have to, but you can if you want, participate, you don't have to, but, and all of a sudden they found themselves participating in the worship of Baal and started to do some of the practicing and getting to know the women, getting a part of their worship, getting, eating part of their festivities, they were seduced and they started having sexual relations, A, with the women, but B, as in God's eyes, they were having an adulterous affair because they had abandoned God, who is their spouse, for someone else. This is what he's talking about. That you, the teaching of Balaam is that you are being seduced to participate in activities in these other temples to eat the food that's been sacrificed there, to, to be a part of the community, that it's okay to belong. And what is happening is that you are being removed from God. And your heart and your body, your spirit is being removed. And you are in an adulterous affair with another God. So you have some there who are teaching that it's okay to participate in these cultural activities. He said you also have others who are uh, hold on to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Now, the Nicolaitans, I just have to say, we don't know much about them other than what's in Revelation. There's some conjecture of who that might be or what it might be. What we do have is a picture of, and it was mentioned in Ephesians, is that the Nicolaitans were a group that almost would be moved to the Gnosticism, Gnosticism in which what you do with the body, you can do whatever you want with it. 
all that God cares about is the mind or maybe the spirit. So they lived a very, um, uh, they lived out of their feelings and out of their desires, very uh, promiscuous. And, and so they could do whatever they wanted because it doesn't matter what you do um, with your body. It's only, God is only interested in the mind. And, and so they did whatever feels good. Now, I just want you to know, that is not anything of what Christ would say. He never said, do what feels right. He actually never said, never, he didn't say, do what feels uh, what's right in your heart. I know we hear that a lot. Just do what's in your heart. Do what feels good. Do what is uh, that. Do what we know is all our feelings, all our doing, all our desires are sin tainted. And when we do those, we are leaving Christ and doing our own thing. There is a this dry rot that's taking place in Pergamum that is there is that we call it cultural assimilation. That is that the process in which a person or a group of people start to represent another group. Okay. And that full assimilation occurs when new members of a society like new believers in Jesus Christ become indistinguishable from members of another group. Meaning that people who are following Jesus Christ were acting like, talking like, doing like somebody who is not a follower of Jesus Christ. You could not tell the difference. They were just like everybody else. And so Jesus says, I have this against you. You have become like everybody else and you have become very sin-oriented, doing your desires and what you think feels good, what is you think your heart says, whatever it is, you're doing that. And that is not following Christ. That's following your sinful self. And then the third issue he brought up is you are not doing any discipline. He says there, he says that you got the Nicolaitans, you have the... Um, the teaching of Balaam, and he says, there, repent, therefore. The question is, who is he saying should repent? Those who follow Balaam and that teaching of, of uh, it's okay to participate? Or the Nicolaitans who says, hey, do what feels good? No. When he calls to repent, he's talking to those who are faithful followers. And what they are doing is that they are letting what has taken place, these false teachings, these bad teachings, these sinful activities, they have let them go and have not said anything, have done anything. And what they don't know, that those teachings are that water that's wicking into their building, into the very fiber of who they are, and it's creating dry rot. And it's destroying them from the inside out. The body in Pergamum, the healthy ones, are full of dry rot because of what the moisture from those other things, the teaching of those other things are seeping in and destroying the, the strength, the steadiness, and the maturity that Christ is bringing. And so when Jesus says repent, he's talking to the believer saying, you need to start discipline, disciplining those who are false. Now, what does di repent mean? You may say, well, what do they mean? It means stop it. Stop doing nothing. Turn around, get near to Christ, and do what is right in his eyes. Not in your eyes, not what feels good, but what is right in Christ. For those who are being deceived and seduced are brothers and sisters. And, and you not saying anything is letting them go. And it's not love. That's not what Christ would do. He would go after the one who will, the one and leave the 99. So he says to the one who conquers, so the one who um, will do discipline, one who will confront false teaching, the one who will um, say no to what feels good and what you uh, what your body wants to do and and do what is right in Christ. The one who is con conquers will be given some of the hidden manna. I'm not sure what that might mean. A speculation is, as I've read, 
is that manna was what was given in the desert when the people were wandering for 40 years of, in, uh, of Israel. And that was the bread that came from heaven and they ate it for 40 years. And what Moses said was to collect a pot of it and put it in the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat the, where the Ten Commandments were kept. And so some are saying that might be the hidden manna. That manna that was taken, that came down from heaven, is given and placed at the very mercy seat of God, where God's throne is. That's kind of amazing that you'd be given some of the hidden manna, the food from heaven, where God sits. Kind of like when he says to Ephesus from the eating the, the tree of, from the tree of life, which is in the presence of God. He said they'll be given a white stone, the one who conquers. The, a white stone would be used for judgment, white and a black. And if you were guilty, the, those would cast out their black stone and say, yeah, you are guilty. But if you can't put out a white stone, that meant you were innocent. So amazing. To do what is right, to do the one who overcomes, overcomes and is faithful to Christ, the one who confronts false teaching and stays uh, near Christ and what his desires are, you're given food from heaven, you will be declared innocent, and you'll be given a new name. I find it amazing that Jesus likes to give new names all the time. You ever notice that? Peter, he called him the rock, or Thomas, the doubting one, or James and John, the sons of thunder. He gives a new name, and you will be given a new name, the one who is able to conquer. So, there's a little bit about Pergamum. So what can we take away from all this that we've been just kind of looking at? First one is this. As followers of Jesus Christ, we have been called to be salt and light in our world. We have not been called to look exactly like everybody. We have not been called to uh, fit in. We have not been called to have no distinguishing mark. We have not been called to be blah. We have been called to be light and salt in our community and in our world. And when we assimilate into our world, we are just trying to be like everybody else. And that's kind of blah and bland. I want you to know, we have not been called to be blah. We have been called to be significant people in this world as salt and light to bring life and hope in Jesus Christ. Second, this is a hard one. We are called to discipline false teachers and leaders. When leaders or teachers start teaching bad things, we're be, things that are off the wall, we need to say, stop. We need to say, don't. We need to say, you cannot teach. We need to be able to say, you are not able to lead. There's a lot of false stuff out there. I just want to tell you that. And, and it sounds also good. There is out there that prosperity gospel. And I know we use that term loosely, but when anybody says that, that God wants to bless you so you have all the money or that you are wealthy and healthy and wise and all that stuff, that's not the gospel. That's false teaching. That's, that's Balaam. There's not a person around who, would, uh, everybody who looks for winning the lottery or anybody else doing, they think they're going to win it big. When you follow Christ, it's not about winning it big. That's a false teaching. Prosperity as a follower of Jesus Christ. Um, that's not Christ. Just want you to know, we need to say stop that. There are those who say name it and claim it. That if you're you're praying for healing and and that that if you 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 claim it you heal, you will get it, that's false. Anything that happens is because of the grace of God. We ask. We are not God, and when you start saying, "Well, I claimed it, and God has to give me," you just um, you just removed yourself uh, from being um, a follower and a, and made yourself a demander. That's a false, false teaching. There are also some who will um, want you to 
just to fit in, just like what Balaam and the Nickelodeons wanted. I just want to say we're not meant to fit in. Um, we were made to be significant. And and anybody that tries just to, to fit in, to just have a life that is normal, normal, um, is not about the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ is radical and it changes things. And we need to be aware of Balaam's teaching, that, that teaching that seduces us away from Christ. I, I'm going to name some things here and you may disagree with me greatly and that's okay. Um, but I think we've been seduced. The body of Christ has been seduced in these things and what it has done is it's taken us away from Christ. It has leaked into us and, it, and it's destroying the body. It's not building us up. One of those areas is politics. Politics. I, Politics are dividing already. And in the church, we have made politics Christian or non-Christian. Politics are not Christian in any way. Our goal as followers of Jesus Christ is to follow Jesus. Whether you are a Republican or a Democrat or an Independent or anything in between or outside of that, that's your opinion and you're voting and you're talking about things um, that your desires are. There is not a Christian party. Um, we've been seduced thinking that one of them is more Christian than the other. They're both developments of this world and Satan has his hands involved in both. Whenever our talk and conversation is more about is more about a politics or politicians than Christ, we know we've been seduced and we've walked away from Christ. I think another area is end times. Yeah, end times. People are fascinated about end times. The book of Revelation, what we're looking at, is meant to encourage the body of Christ. To, for us to be faithful, to be doing the work that's been set before us, to live in a way that honors Christ no matter the consequences and no matter what comes our way. But most have used end times, the, the searching out of things, as a way of not doing our first command. Go and make disciples of all nations. We have fought over end times. We have all kinds of divisions about end times. And it has, and all that has not moved us further into mission or helping people come to know Christ. All it has done is embattle us. And so this teaching of Balaam that we need to know end times, that we have to figure things out, or is this this, or this, is this hurricane this, is this disease this, is that? No. No, it's just a distraction. It's a way of seducing you away from Christ and doing the work we need to do. And another Balaam teaching is our hardness of heart. We wish a lot of things and we demand a lot of things. And when we're honest, they're about things that we want. And our heart has grown cold, um, cold to what needs to be done. Jesus said, it's, it, what we need to do is go visit the prisoner to visit the sick, to give clothing to the naked, to give food to the hungry, to, to help the orphan and the widow and the foreigner, that we are to be active in community and those who are outcasts and those who are being uh, attacked in ways, whether it's from our government or from people, that Christians are supposed to be involved and in the gap standing in the gap of these situations and these hardcore sinful situations. And what we have done is stood on the sidelines because our heart hasn't been broken by what breaks God's heart. 
And what has hardened our heart is our comfort and what is feeding our desires. And so I bring to you just a few things that of Balaam's teaching that has caught us and seduced us. Politics, um, end times, and our own hardness of heart. And those things have kept us away from walking with Christ. And Jesus says to us, repent. Stop. Turn. Return to me and do what is right. Otherwise, we are like Pergamum. The dry rot becomes so extensive that there is no strength, there is no foundation, and the building crashes. Let's pray. Gracious God, I just thank you for what you are doing. I thank you for this amazing word to us. Father, help us to hear Jesus. Help us to hear his word to us about, about us being in our culture. We need to be a part of the culture, but we are to be also influencers in this culture to bring salt and light. Father, forgive us. Forgive us for how we have been so seduced in not being representatives of Christ. Forgive us for how we have let our desires pull us away, how we have let um, the hardness of our heart stop us from being that salt and light in our world. Father, we come as a body. We come repenting. We stop and we need to turn around and return to Jesus. Give us courage to do what is right. Give us courage to stop. Give us courage to face those who want us to go in a different direction, who is seducing us. Help us to say, stop it to those who are teaching false doctrine, and bad, bad theology. Help us to be your representative in our community. To you be glory and honor and praise this day and every day. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I thank you for being with us. Um, I know it's been a long one. Um, it's a powerful, powerful message. I encourage you to to search it out, okay? Search it out, read it, study it, listen to what Jesus has. Um, this is one of the most deadly things, is having dry rot, of it seeping in unaware and destroying our life, destroying our life as body of Christ. And so uh, let's seek it together and uh, bring light and dryness and reconstruction in repentance uh, to our to our body. Blessings to you. Good night.